These days, the UFC or Ultimate Fighting Championship is an organization that is synonymous with the sport of mixed martial arts. Conor McGregor, Ronda Rousey and Khabib have become household names to anyone with even a passing interest in sports. However, the UFC wasn't always the multi-billion dollar entertainment behemoth that we know today. In the 90s, not only did the UFC struggle to get people to their events, the whole sport of MMA was outright banned in most parts of the United States in 1997, with Senator John McCain describing the sport as human cockfighting. While MMA event organizers and fans in the States had to endure some tough times, something incredible was happening across the Pacific Ocean that same year. Pride FC, a Japanese MMA promotion company, held the first of a series of events that would change the face of mixed martial arts forever, becoming the home of the world's best fighters at the time and broadcasting events to 40 different countries worldwide. Over the next few years, Pride FC events became a phenomenon, especially in its host country of Japan, where fighters gained at the time unprecedented amounts of popularity, media attention and of course, money. Just a decade after its first event in 2007, Pride was bought by the owners of the UFC and closed its offices in October of that year, ending an era of mixed martial arts that many fans of the sport, even today, remember fondly. So what happened? How did Pride FC manage to become the world's home of MMA before crashing and burning, all in a span of only 10 years? As is the case with many things in Japan, Pride FC's downfall can be directly linked to the criminal underworld of Japan, the Yakuza. In this video, we'll take a look at how Pride FC itself got started, how it became one of the biggest MMA promotions to ever exist, and how it all ended when the organization got a bit too involved with the Yakuza. This is the story of the rise and fall of Pride Fighting Championships. What better way to start talking about the history of Pride FC than, well, an actual fight that kickstarted the whole thing. In 1994, the founder of Japanese wrestling organization UWFI, Takada Nobuhiko, noticed the growing interest in mixed martial arts in Japan, which was largely sparked by a tournament held earlier that year called Valetudo Japan. In this tournament, a fighter called Rickson Gracie absolutely dominated his competitors, winning each one of his fights in the first round and taking first place. Now, to those of you who are passionate about MMA, the family name Gracie most likely doesn't need an introduction. For those who are, like me, completely new to the world of mixed martial arts, here's a quick summary of why you should know about the Gracie family. For over 80 years now, the Gracie family from Brazil has left its mark on the world of fighting. In the 1920s, the Gracie brothers took what they learned from Japanese Jiu Jitsu master Maeda Mitsuyo and transformed it into their own fighting style, now widely known by the name Brazilian Jiu Jitsu. By the time that Ricks and Gracie competed in the Japanese tournament in 1994, the Gracie name was already well known among MMA enthusiasts at the time and Rickson was considered to be the strongest member of this prestigious family. Takada, the aforementioned UWFI founder and himself a professional wrestler, saw potential for a great fight between one of his organization's wrestlers and Rickson and Gracie and subsequently started issuing multiple challenges to Gracie. The Brazilian Jiu Jitsu black belt, however, rejected all of Takada's invitations, which caught the attention of Japanese wrestler Anjo Yochi. Anjo, who was considered to be the strongest wrestler of the UWFI at the time, personally challenged Gracie in a press conference, where he stated that he could beat the Brazilian in less than a minute. Rickson watched the tape, but never responded. What he didn't know at the time was that this was a perfect example of what people like to call the calm before the storm. Anjo would take Gracie's silence personally and decided to take things more than a few steps too far. On December 7, 1994, Anjo packed his bags and boarded a plane to Los Angeles airport. Accompanied by the Japanese media, he made his way to Gracie's gym in Santa Monica to personally confront and challenge Rickson. Rickson, who was at home with a cold at the time, got a call about the whole situation 
taped up his fists and made his way to the gym. When he arrived there, he told the media to leave until they were done. Ancho then asked Gracie if he was ready for a fight. Gracie replied, I was born ready, mother f Only one videotape of this encounter, filmed by a student of the Gracie gym, is known to exist, but has never been released to the public. While we don't have any footage of the actual fight itself, the pictures from after the fight tell the whole story. Ancho stood no chance and returned to Japan with more than a few bruises on his face and a heavy defeat on his mind. Back in Japan, Ancho's defeat made huge headlines, and soon people would pressure Takada, the UWFI president, into personally stepping into the ring with Gracie. The style of wrestling that Takada made his money with up until this point was seemingly on its way out, thanks in large part to the rising popularity of mixed martial arts. A showcase with Takada vs Gracie as its main event would not only give the Japanese wrestler a chance to avenge his countrymen, it would also allow Takada to branch out into a new and exciting form of fighting. While setting up said event, Takada received help from two different parties. Fuji Television, one of Japan's biggest TV stations, and a certain Yakuza member who provided 50 million yen in funds in order to get the event rolling. With that, Pride Fighting Championships was born, and its first event was highly anticipated by the Japanese public. October 11th, 1997. Location, Tokyo Dome, home of the Yomiuri Giants baseball team. Close to 50,000 spectators assemble inside the arena, also known as the Big Egg, in order to witness the start of a new era of mixed martial arts not only for Japan, but for the whole world. For the following two hours, they got to enjoy a total of 14 fighters from 8 different countries, duking it out in the ring. What everyone was waiting for though was of course the main event. Rickson Gracie vs Takara Nobuhiko. As hyped up as this matchup was, most people correctly predicted that the now 37-year-old Rickson Gracie would defeat his Japanese opponent without much of a problem. After less than 5 minutes, the fight was over and the Brazilian had once again come out on top. While this fight was not particularly evenly matched or technically impressive, it was a spectacle that everyone expected, something that Pride would become known for over the following years. The first Pride event was followed up by a few more of the same kind, with Pride 4 actually featuring a rematch between Takara and Gracie that was, however, seen as lackluster by many. While the first event was a big box office success, the Pride showcases that succeeded it were considered to be a financial failure. Pride could have crashed and burned right there, only a year after their first event. However, after Pride 4 took place, the organization brought in businessman Morishita Naoto, who took over creative duties and transformed Pride into something incredible. Together with Kiyohara Kunio of Fuji TV, he devised a master plan that focused on two main areas, bringing the best fighters in the world to Pride FC, while also finding new and exciting Japanese talent to showcase. Pride's future events managed to achieve both of these goals. Over the next few years, they were the home of some of the biggest names in the history of MMA. When they managed to bring in fighters like Noguera, Krokop, and Fedor Emelianenko, they had the three top fighters in the world at the time, competing at their events. Steven Quadros, host and commentator of Pride events said, When they finally met, that was like the Olympics to me. They were the three top fighters in the game. They weren't about smack talk. It was all about the sport and answering a simple question, who was the best fighter? However, finding the best fighter was not necessarily the goal of Pride FC. The organization behind Pride events, having a background in professional wrestling, prioritized putting on a good show over honest and clean fighting. What the fighters did in order to make things entertaining was up to them, and almost everything was allowed, if it meant that the crowd got some good entertainment for their money. This anything-goes attitude by Pride even extended to the use of performance-enhancing drugs. While drug testing was certainly done, PEDs were specifically excluded from said testing, as confirmed by this contract between the Nevada Athletic Commission and Pride FC. While Pride FC's stance on steroid usage and focus on entertainment value over clean fighting might not be everyone's cup of tea, it certainly worked from a business perspective. The fans loved what they saw, especially the Japanese, and they made sure to let the fighters know just how much they enjoyed watching them. 
Mixed martial artists became the definition of rock stars in Japan, featuring in TV commercials, soap operas, and other TV shows. All while delivering fights in stadiums filled to the brim with up to 80,000 spectators. After a night of amazing fights, the real party was just getting started. Expensive alcohol, beautiful women, everything the Pride fighters wanted was theirs. Many fighters fondly remember stories from the Pride FC era and the wild parties that took place in Tokyo's Roppongi district. Former UFC lightweight champion Chuck Liddell recalls. One night I ended up an hour and a half away from the hotel at some girl's house out in the middle of nowhere. I had to get on a train and figure out how to get back. It was a lot of fun. I had a blast. But while on the surface things seemed to work out perfectly for both the fans and the promotion, trouble was brewing inside Pride of Sea. Trouble that was spearheaded by the organization's Yakuza ties that existed from the very beginning. Soon, the world's biggest MMA promotion would fall from grace just as quickly as it got there. Like most big sporting events, Pride had people from all walks of life sitting among its tens of thousands of spectators that visited each event. From MMA enthusiasts who saved up their hard-earned money to see the best fighters in the world smash their faces in, to the rich and famous of Japanese society who were there just because it was the cool thing to do at the time. One person in particular always stood out though, a person who was sitting ringside at every Pride event. A Japanese guy in his 60s who made it a habit to always wear a baseball hat with Forever Young at Heart printed on it. The name of this man was Momose Hiromichi, the Phantom of Pride. To some fighters, he was nothing more than that weird old guy with the hat who was always just there to enjoy the spectacle. Steven Quadros remembered one story in particular involving MMA fighter Quinton Rampage Jackson and the old man. He came to all the events with that baseball hat on, and Quinton wanted to go up and steal his hat. Quinton was an impish guy and always doing things like that. I said, Quinton, look at me, look at me. You don't know who that guy is. Don't do that. And thank God he didn't. So who was this Momose guy? You may remember that earlier I mentioned a Yakuza member investing 50 million yen into Pride when they were setting up their first event. That Yakuza member was none other than Momose who had not only a criminal past, but was also fascinated with martial arts almost his entire life. When he was young, he had aspirations to become a sumo wrestler, a goal that he pursued not without success. With his high school sumo club, he placed second in a Kanto region tournament and even participated in the Kokutai, the annual national sports festival of Japan. It was at the age of 23 when he worked as a bouncer for a Tokyo nightclub that he first got a taste of the Yakuza lifestyle, smuggling handguns and ending up in jail 5 years later at the age of 28. During his 6 years in prison, he reportedly spent 7 hours a day reading books while also writing his own poems. Some of these poems were actually released as a collection after he left prison, along with many other books that he proudly presented on his beautifully 2000s website, which I very much enjoyed exploring while doing research for this video. But no matter how much literature and poetry Momose surrounded himself with, he was still a gangster at heart, even after returning to civilian life at the age of 32. Journalist Hirata Shu claims, after being released from the slammer, he stopped by at Sendai City to eat deep fried pork fillet and then went right back into a few years in the sandpaper business, roughing people up. He was basically a so called collector, mobster, thug. His daily operations were things like chasing down a vanished ex member of the Board of Education who embezzled over a million dollars from the golf course development project, or paying a visit to a business owner who refused to pay his tab. The sandpaper business, as Hirata liked to call it, seemingly made Momose enough money to spend on financing a mixed martial arts event, which he did in 1997 when Pride FC was established. After Morishita took over Pride, Momose let him do his work and took on a more low-key yet very important role inside the company. His behind-the-scenes work at Pride earned him the nickname the Phantom of Pride. Without his passion for martial arts and his early investments, the organization might never have taken off the way that it eventually did. In 2003, Morishita Naoto, the mastermind behind Pride FC, was found dead in a hotel room in Tokyo. 
According to the local police, Modishita hung himself in the bathroom after an argument with his mistress, which is a version of the story that many people have started to doubt over the years. Not only because the Japanese police is generally not the most trustworthy source when trying to find the true cause of death of a controversial murder case, but also because of the supposed involvement of a mistress. Including an affair in a murder case is sometimes an easy tactic when trying to cover up a murder. Mostly because the wife of the victim will then choose to not investigate the case any further, in fear of finding out more than they would like. What made Morishita's death even more suspicious was the fact that there were people who, without a doubt, profited from his passing. Businessmen Sakakibara Nobuyuki and his Korean-born Yakuza friend Kim Dok-su, who was known in Japan simply as Ijizaka. While Sakakibara, one of Pride's co-founders, was set to directly replace Morishita as the organization's president, Ijizaka was looking to replace Momose and his crew as the new Yakuza group behind the scenes of Pride. One of the most detailed accounts of what happened at Pride at the time comes from Miro Miatovic, then manager of both Mirko Krokop and Fedor Emelianenko. The first time that I'd seen that there was actually something going on behind the scenes was at that specific event, where there were probably, I'd say, between 100 to 200 armed Yakuza guys from two different groups, basically looking like they were setting up battle lines and ready to start open warfare. Ishizaka and his Osaka-based crew were having a major dispute with Momose's crew, and it came pretty close to shots being fired at that specific event. So it was a pretty dangerous scene behind the scenes. According to Miatovic, Momose was pushed out of Pride FC around November of 2003. Following that month's event, Momose pretty much stopped spectating the fights, like he did for many years, which could easily be explained by him leaving the company and being replaced by his rival, Ishizaka. Even with Momose gone, Yakuza business continued as usual. One of the main money makers for the gangs was, of course, gambling. A business that the Yakuza have multiple centuries of experience in. Besides influencing referees to make matches go the way that the promoter and the Yakuza wanted them to, their favorite method of making money from the fights was by influencing the outcome of fights by shifting the odds in the favor of a specific fighter. One perfect example of this specific method was the fight between Mirko Krokop and Heath Herring. While Krokop had a full four months to prepare for his opponent's fighting style, Herring wasn't so lucky. For three months, he thought that he would be fighting against a wrestler. Only 10 days before the fight, he was told that he would actually be fighting Krokop, who was a kickboxer, a style completely different from wrestling. Obviously, Krokop won the fight, resulting in a nice payday for the Yakuza and those with insider information. Now, as smooth as the transition from Morishita and Momose to Sakakibara and Ishizaka might have seemed, it was also the beginning of the end. Only a few years after they took over Pride FC, they would go a bit too far and crash the whole organization into the ground. By 2003, Pride was at its peak in terms of popularity, but there were several competitors who wanted in on the crazy amounts of money that were involved in the sport. The most significant of these competitors in the MMA space was K1, a kickboxing promotion that enjoyed great success and occasionally collaborated with Pride FC in setting up events. Besides Pride and K1, there was one more significant promotion in Japan at the time, Inoki Bombayé organized by Inoki Antonio, a legendary Japanese professional wrestler whose 1976 fight against Muhammad Ali is considered to be the precursor of modern MMA. In 2003, Inoki Bombayé planned to host a New Year's Eve event, which was done purely with entertainment in mind, compared to the more serious events by their competitors. For their New Year's Eve event, Inoki and his promotion wanted to hire Fedor Emelianenko, the world-famous fighter from Russia. As you may remember, Fedor successfully competed in Pride FC at the time. He was, however, not under a long-term contract with the organization, but instead worked on a fight-by-fight -fight basis. Hiring him for the Inoki Bombaye should have been a trouble-free affair, but Pride and their new Yakuza leadership had other plans. In their mind, and that of Fuji TV, who had a broadcasting deal with Pride FC at the time, Fedor was their fighter, and seeing him fight on another network on Japanese television was absolutely unacceptable. 
One Inoki associate who had to feel the wrath of Pride of Sea was Kawamata Seiya, an Inoki Bombaye promoter who had a meeting with Sakakibara and Ishisaka from Pride. In the meeting, he was told by the Pride top dogs that if Fedor was to fight on Nippon TV, Kiyohara from Fuji TV would cancel their contract with Dreamstage Entertainment, Sakakibara's company. Kawamata from Inoki's promotion recalled, I was shocked that Sakakibara would be present at this sort of meeting. His attitude was totally different than usual. He threw a fight magazine at me and said, What the hell is this? Fedor's agent at the time, Mjatovic, again offers us some interesting insight into what was going on around that time. His account of what happened comes from a 2012 interview with Spike TV's MMA Uncensored program and is much more shocking. To my great surprise, Sakaki Barra and four Yakuza guys turn up to the Okara Hotel in Kobe. I was told I had to sign over my rights to Fyodor or I wasn't going to leave Kobe alive. Mjatovic did make it out of this meeting alive, but had yet another meeting with the Yakuza at the Hilton Hotel in Tokyo, where they convinced him to sign their contract. One of the guys pulled out his gun, put it on the table, and we continued the talk. And when I continued to push back, he picked the gun up and aimed it to my head and said, you know what's going to happen if you don't sign. With a gun to his head, Mjatovic had no choice but to sign Pride's contract, which gave them exclusive rights to Fedor's fights without giving his manager any kind of compensation. After these two shocking encounters with Sakakibara and his Yakuza partners, Mjatovic had enough and collaborated with the National Police Agency of Japan. Sakakibara was well aware of Mjatovic going to the police and apparently wanted him assassinated, which forced Fedor's manager to go into hiding for about two years, living under false addresses and changing his actual place of residence on a monthly basis. On June 5, 2006, the chief of the National Police Agency visited the Fuji TV headquarters and spoke to the company's director of compliance. As soon as the MPA chief had exited the building, Fuji TV cancelled its contract with Pride FC. Even with the media picking up on the story and the MMA world in shock, there were attempts to save Pride FC. The UFC and its Las Vegas-based parent company Sufa bought Pride in March of 2007 and intended to run both promotions side by side. The last Pride FC event, titled Pride 34 Kamikaze, took place on April 8, 2007 in the Saitama Super Arena. By August, Sufa had pretty much given up on the Pride project. The name of the company was now tainted in the eye of the public and a new TV deal seemed to be an impossibility. In October of 2007, Pride's headquarters in Tokyo were officially closed, changing the world of MMA forever, not only in Japan, but worldwide. The UFC, of course, became even bigger than Pride had ever been and is still going strong to this day. In 2015, Sakakibara founded a new MMA promotion called Ryzen FC, which has enjoyed a good amount of success over the past few years. As for Momose, the interesting character with the forever young at heart baseball cap, he survived long enough to witness the drama surrounding Pride and its eventual downfall, but was found dead in his apartment in 2008, at the age of 67. The story of Pride FC has been a wild one from the very beginning, and it's very hard to imagine what MMA would look like nowadays if the Yakuza wouldn't have ruined the fun for everyone involved. What do you think? Would Pride now be as big or maybe even bigger than the UFC without the gang's involvement? Let me know in the comments. Also, remember to like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe for more Yakuza related content if you haven't already. Either way, thank you so much for watching. Sayonara.